All right. Welcome, everybody. So my name is Andrew Wynn. Um, I'm the executive director of the Inside Garden Program. We're a 501c nonprofit who offers in-prison programming and reentry services for the people we serve. Um, I do want to kind of run this a little bit like how my programs run inside so you can get a feel of it, you can understand it. Um, and so, um, but before I kind of talk about everything else, um, a little bit about me, um, born and raised in Sacramento. Um, it's also the same county where I was sent to prison twice. Um, and so I did, you know, two prison terms here in California. I narrowly escaped a life sentence the last time I was incarcerated. Um, and um, luckily enough, I didn't get a life sentence and I could be here today. Uh, but, you know, part of that is, you know, I just didn't have the kind of support, you know, young people need. And I just didn't have a lot of different things. And so um, my journey has been long. It hasn't been easy. Reentry was tougher, I would say, in many ways in prison. Um, yeah, and then in 20 or 2009, I paroled out of prison. Um, I paroled homeless. I didn't have anything. I didn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out. Um, and in that, you know, I just, I went through struggles. I went through like a toxic relationship with somebody. Um, and, but, you know, through it all, I kept persevering. Um, I went in, I enrolled at Sacramento City College. At Sacramento City College, I didn't transfer to UCLA. At UCLA, you know, I just got really busy and involved. Um, as you know, like being at a four-year institution has significantly more resources than, say, a, a community college. Um, and so it allowed me to just to kind of even figure out who I am and develop myself. And in that process, um, I found other folks who had experiences similar to mine. Um, and we got together and we're like, let's just start Underground Scholars. Yeah, so my friends and I, we, we started Underground Scholars at UCLA, which is a campus equity program for previously incarcerated students. And in that, we just started like making headway and doing things and making moves. And when I graduated, I'm like, well, what's next? I got a job with uh, Project Rebound at Sacramento State, turned a, um, a very small program, like eight students in a very small budget into a $3.3 million um, budget allocation through the California State Legislature. Um, and I think we're about 70 students now over, over, over at Project Rebound, so grown tremendously. Um, oh, Project Rebound is a campus equity program that is funded through the state uh, to provide uh, campus resources and support systems for people who are coming out of uh, jails and prisons. Um, so, you know, I got to be like, be with more of my own people. And if you know anything, like there's an enculturation about people who've been to prison. So we have our own language. We do things sometimes differently, right? Like I'll sometimes catch myself like eating an apple in a hotel room and then thrown in the toilet, right? That's not like normal behavior for people who like never done time. But if you've done time, you don't want the apple core like rotten in your cell. So you throw it in the toilet to get rid of it so you don't stink up your cell. And so I still find myself being very much like immersed in that incorporation related to my incarceration experience. So, you know, I, you know, was able to kind of use those experiences and really um, elevate other students. So some of my students are doing really great things, um, policy work, um, you know, one of them got a commutation, another got a pardon. Um, and being licensed in, in their field, so an LCSW. So there's a lot of things that, you know, we are able to accomplish together over at Project Rebound Sacramento State. Um, and through my work, you know, supporting students, through my work, passing legislation like Band of Box in higher education, like the Incarcerated Students Bill of Rights, um, making budget, um, budget requests to the legislature, all those things really played into, like, branding me as somebody who's a leader within this field. Um, and much more so because it's like my friends who are recognizing me, right? My own people who are recognizing me. It's not always like the people on the outside, like, oh, you're doing good things. And it's like, no, it's my own, my own folks. 
And so they're the ones who, um, who really uplift me. And when the draw for executive director at Insight Garden Program came open, it was my friends that recommended me. It was my friends that said, hey, you should really apply to this. And next thing I know, I'm getting phone calls on a regular basis saying, you apply to it. Please apply to it. I, I applied. I didn't take it seriously. Um, I didn't understand how far I was going to make it into the process until I was like five interviews into the whole thing. Um, I'm like, wow, okay, now they're serious about me. I didn't know like I qualify for this job, but here I am. So um, in September of 2021, I took on the role of executive director of the project of, of Insight Garden Program, as you can see it there on the screen. Um, and it's been great. It's also been one of the toughest jobs I've ever had. Um, you know, working and supporting people who are in prison, who are in reentry, but also leading a staff of people who are just super intelligent. Um, I'm only as good as the people that that work that I get to work with. Um, and so they challenge me on a regular basis to be better, be a better version of myself and and be about it much more than just a talking figure, much more than just somebody who leads or can do policy work or any of those things, right? They challenge me. Um, and so yeah, it's been a really great moment for me to like grow in that space, to be able to be the, you know, the ED of the Insight Garden Program, to work in nine different prisons, to, um, to just be with like my own people at the end of the day. So uh, that's a little bit about me. What we're gonna do like first is I'm gonna run us through a meditation a grounding exercise. There will be a visualization, a visualization part of it, where um, you'll see there'll be a visualization, visualization. And then what I would hope is, you know, a few people from the audience being able to share what came up for them after the meditation. And so we'll talk about that a little bit, and then we'll go in through uh, the PowerPoint a little bit. I don't like reading PowerPoints. I like to just sit up here and just talk to folks. Um, so we'll we'll run through it like lightly, I hopefully, you know, I don't bore you with like all the details. Um, and then after that, um, we'll talk about reentry. And we'll show you some photographs of like what we're doing inside. And then in, in that, uh, we'll wrap it up with a video um, from our reentry part of our reentry program. And then I'll, we'll have contact information up there too. I have some business cards. Um, and then I also heard that some of you may be interested in internships. There are opportunities for that as well within the Insight Garden Program. We're over at Sacramento State. We're an official uh, internship site over there. So whether it's uh, your major is criminal justice or social work or what communications, those are all kind of um, degree fields that we would you know want uh, interns uh, doing. Or if you like gardening and wanted to garden inside prisons, there might be opportunities for that. We're in um, San Quentin State Prison. Um, that's nearby CMF, California Medical Facility, and Solano. So there's three prisons kind of close to here uh, where there might be um, opportunities. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try to drop my voice, drop my energy a little bit, um, and then we're going to get into a meditation. So find yourself in a comfortable spot. And then for those who are not like uncomfortable with closing your eyes, I'll put my water bottle up here. You can just stare at that as if that's a, a point of contact where you want to draw your eyes. And so find a comfortable position that allows you to be relaxed and attentive to the present moment. Roll your shoulders back. Relax your neck. Relax your face and jaw. Close your eyes or focus up here. Take a few deep breaths and scan your body. Noticing any places of ease or discomfort. Invite your breath into those spaces of discomfort and allow your body to soften. Continue to observe your breath and arrive in the present moment. Now imagine you are a plant. 
feel roots dropping from your feet, going deep down into the earth. Breathe the earth's energy into your body and feel your upper body upright like a stem in the air. Imagine you have leaves emerging from your stem, taking in the sunlight and carbon dioxide and sending out oxygen. Just for a few moments, let go of or of any thoughts and practice simply existing. Let go of any worries, memories, or plans for the future and just be. Feel your connection to the earth, sky, and other elements, the way a flower or vegetable plant grows in the garden. You find your, your mind wandering, that's okay. No judgment. Just notice those thoughts and let them float away like a cloud in the wind. See if you can bring your attention back to the flow of breath. Imagine you are breathing in carbon dioxide and sending out oxygen. As you breathe, feel how you are rooted in the earth, taking in sunlight, breathing the air, offering oxygen to others in relationship to all plants, animals, insects, and microbes around you. Feel your oneness with all other forms of life in your environment and on this planet. Take a few moments to notice how your body feels. Enjoy any feelings of connectedness and a gift of being alive on earth. When you are ready, bring your attention back to your body in this room. Wiggle your fingers and your toes. And when you are ready, open your eyes and look around. All right, so I do want to do a quick check-in. If there's something that you experienced during that meditation, whether it's the plant um, that you envisioned yourself being, I think it would be kind of nice to share that. So if there's a few people that would want to share what came up for them during the meditation, there's, there's space for that. Somebody want to share? connected I felt as though I was like connected to earth like my roots were like part of the dirt and like we were like tight like we weren't far apart from each other so that's kind of how I felt <laughs> thank you anybody else you felt calm and you felt at peace yeah, and that's a big part of what we want to bring inside, right? In, in a world where it can be very chaotic, in a world where there's like very strict rules, where it's very black and white and rigid and that's and very static, um, being able to have that, create that space inside a prison is important, right? Like that calmness, that peace. Um, when chaos is all the way around, we can create that inside. So thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else? I was picturing myself as a big tomato plant in the sun. We haven't had much sun lately, so I was trying to channel the uh, the sun vibes. Yes, yeah, and that's another thing, right? Like, while while prisons may be nature a nature deprived, right, very sanitized spaces to be able to imagine plants or 
yeah, plants that, that you may be familiar with or plants that may bring back memories of like where you come from or your grandma's garden or your grandfather's garden, whoever it might be, right? To be able to create that inside of a prison, it's special, right? People start to connect with what we're trying to do inside. So thank you. We'll do one more if somebody wants to share. If not, we'll move on. So when you said to take note of any discomfort that you were feeling, I noticed a lot of tension in my shoulders. And then you said to take in air and, you know, to relieve that tension. And so I noticed that that's what my body did. And then um, something else that came up for me, the visual visualization, um, I I imagine myself on a hill with lots of flowers, like laying on the hill and my roots coming from like the entire backside of my body and just like rooted into the ground. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, to be able to be transported from, from a space of like discomfort to be able to be grounded into things that are meaningful, you know, and, and to see yourself as a plant is a very kind of special way to be connected with nature, especially, like I said, in prisons. So thank you for sharing. All right, so we're going to go ahead and um, jump in the kind of the slide show. Um, I also have to remember that I need to stay in the space so I can be filmed. Oh, you extended it so I can walk the whole stage? Perfect. That's, that'll work for me. All right, so yeah, here's our mission. Um, you know, we, we wanted to, you know, expand it beyond just in prison and reentry. Uh, we want to make sure that like the connection to the natural world is very much present in all our work, right? That's a big part of what we try to do. I have a coworker who did 30 years in prison, uh, 31 years in prison, 15 of which was done in solitary confinement. And when he got out of solitary confinement, the one thing he sought was our program. It wasn't because like he's going to get a chrono for it or some sort of recognition for it. He just wanted his hands dirty. Um, and I love that part of it because a big part of like who I am is to, to uh, honor like the eight-year-old self, to honor our, our childhood selves. And so to be able to have, uh, to create the, the uh, reconnection of people in prisons and reentry to self, community, and natural world, that's a big part of it, right? Like how do we get to the core of who we are as people? Um, we, we, we have a curriculum that goes along with our gardening. So we don't just show up one day and like, Hey, let's go get dirty. Um, you know, we CDCR has some very like stringent guidelines as to what we can do, what, what needs to be done. And part of that is making sure that we have a curriculum that, um, people can learn from. So it's not just, you know, we do environmental education, getting people like up to date on like some of the, the terms, right? Because in prison, there's people with uh, advanced degrees who can, you know, who may have, who may know uh, botany and some of the other sciences that relate to the environment. And then you have people who do even get through elementary school. And so uh, a big part of what we want to do is create education that's accessible for everybody. And so we get people grounded in the environmental education. We do permaculture training. So where people are able to learn about what it takes to, to grow within permaculture, right? Which is a very specific type of like gardening technique where you can use companion plants, use the environment, draw on pollinators and all the different things that a garden needs to, to survive. So we, we do a permaculture training and then we get into the inner gardening, right? So we, we may walk, a, uh, walk inside our garden when we first show up inside a prison and then we'll, um, we'll go ahead and say, what'd you observe, right? And then, and then, We'll also follow up with some other questions like, and then how does that feel? And then what, how can you take those practices in your own life? One of my favorite examples of that is composting, right? We compost in our garden, in, in, in a few of our uh, gardens inside the prisons. And in that, um, we'll, ask, we'll ask people like, what are parts of your life would you want to compost? Right, taking something that's old or discarded or doesn't necessarily have use anymore, and then process it in such a way where it can enhance 
and enrich your life, just much, much like how compost would if you did it at your own home or your apartment, or wherever you live. And then the, the last, that last arc, uh, number four, is reentry readiness. Um, and we know that people in prison don't always have dates, right? We know that there's life without the possibility of parole. There's life with the possibility of parole. And then there's determinate sentences and everything in between. Um, but we do want to get ready for re do reentry readiness. Um, so no matter where the person is at, we can start preparing them to go home. So if it's a commutation from the governor to be able to get their life without the possibility of parole, um, you know, removed and given uh, given them like a, a a date, then we can you know start supporting that process. We write letters to the board. We write letters to the governor. We we submit letters to get folks uh, ready for that. And I've gotten plenty of people home. Uh, I mean, me personally, I, it, my coworkers too. Um, show of hands, anybody familiar with the movie They Call Us Monsters? No, it's on Netflix. So um, if you ever get an opportunity to watch it, please do. Um, there's a young person in the movie. It's about uh, Juvenile Hall in Los Angeles. So there's a young person named Jared. Um, Jared was sentenced to 162 years at 17 years old. Um, and when his, when, his, um, when his commutation came up to the governor, it was my letter that the governor read and says, you know what, this person, is, this, this person has the support services out there and we feel comfortable letting him go. Jared is now a student at Techno State. He works as um, a, an aide for the Senate Public Safety Committee. Um, he's doing great things, right? He travels and he gets speaking gigs and all kinds of stuff. Um, and to know that like my letters and letters of like the people I work with and my friends in our community, they make a difference. So reentry readiness isn't just saying, hey, when you get home, let's do this. Isn't like, oh, when you get home, some people don't see themselves as going home. And so really trying to empower people to center themselves as people. Um, Inside Garden Program is in nine prisons. Here are the list of prisons that we're at. Um, I know there's a state of California right there and may not be legible, but I'll kind of start from up north and I'll move down south when I uh, mention them. So San Quentin's right there and we're in. There's Solano, which is right there in Vacaville, uh, CMF, also Vacaville, California Healthcare Facility is in Stockton, um, CCWF, Cal Central California Women's Facility, which is in Chachilla. There's Avenal State Prison, which is Kings County, an hour west of Fresno, if you're not familiar with, with Kings. There's... Um, CSP LAC, which is California State Prison, Los Angeles County. We also call that Lancaster. And then we also, we're also at California Institute for Women, which is in Corona in Southern California. So we're in nine different prisons. We were in Folsom Women's, but thankfully they closed that prison down. Um, so I'm really happy that they did, um, even if it means one less program that IGP has. Um, but we're in all the women's facilities. And that's a big part of what we try to do. We try to bring like gender responsive care to the people we're serving inside. Um, here is a mentioned Folsom Women's Facility. Um, so this is a co-design. So this is a design that we took of the space that we have inside the prison that the prison gave us, um, offered us to be able to have a garden. And then we brought it to a classroom and then we designed it together so that it's not us talking to the people in our program, but collectively we come up with the ideas and we put the information together and then we design uh, a garden. This, this is also the same garden where we started our very first salad bar. Uh, so women inside Folsom uh, at the prison were able to grow food and then uh, bring it to the kitchen and then they were able to share it with uh, other women within the prison. So um, it may sound like very minor to us out here where we can do that. But inside prisons, that's that's huge. That's um, a big 
thing to overcome because they tell you, oh, you don't do pep, don't grow peppers because you can make pepper spray or don't grow tomatoes because they can make pruno or whatever it is that they, um, by the way, pruno's wine. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we, we go through a lot of like negotiating with the wardens, um, associate wardens and everybody else to try to um, get that. So here's another women's prison, CCWF. Um, right there, what you can see the bottom right hand corner is our lavender labyrinth. Um, that's at the beginning stages of it. It's much bigger now. Um, so be able to have lavender inside. You may or may not know that lavender will calm you down, has properties that are much more than just um, cosmetic, right? There's healing properties in it. And so um, that's why we grow it. We want people to have access beyond just the, the art of gardening. Um, and here is more of the garden um, at CCWF. You can see that, well, you kind of see there's a bird bath there. There's lavender right there in the background. And there's just all kinds of different plants. We also have raised beds in there um, where I'm standing next to. And, um, and in that, we're able to grow vegetables and stuff. And when we grow vegetables, they're like, don't let the people take them, right? And we're like, well, I'm not the police. Um, I'm not here to hold any kind of line. If you don't want people taking vegetables, that's your job. That's not on me. I'm not here to hold that line. And so we'll grow vegetable, we'll grow food in there. And if it walks off, it walks off. Um, if it makes it to somebody's cell inside of a spread, so be it. But people are able to consume the food inside, whether it's like officially done with the prison or not. Um, and here's more, more photographs that um, I believe that sunflower up in the right-hand corner is, um, that looks like Avenal State Prison, I think. I don't know, but in the bottom right-hand corner, that's also CCWF um, right there. So yeah, we're doing all kinds of gardening um, inside. It's sometimes difficult to get photographs. So our, some of our photographs are new, some of them are old um, because the prisons like to control all images coming in and out of the institution. We also, you know, we, we, we incorporate our values as an organization to our curriculum. So it's more than just like, oh, gardening, right? More than just inner gardening or permaculture or re, um, or reentry readiness, right? It's making sure that we, we, you know, we get folks really current information. And so we use anti-oppression framework, um, I talked about learning accessibility, um, the personal work, the inner work. And then on top of it all, like while we are experts in our field, we want to make sure that people have the ability to share what, what's coming up for them, what kind of things that they need. And so our, our curriculum is um, we receive feedback on it and we alter it, right? Our curriculum is fluid. It's not static. It's always changing. Um, another Big part of our participant feedback is, um, is we recently went through a strategic plan process for the organization. Rather than having just the board and staff members there, we had people in reentry provide feedback. We had people in our in-prison programs provide feedback. And so we want to make sure that like we're uplifting the voices of the people we're serving and we're not talking to them, but it is a, a reciprocated kind of conversation between who we're serving and and what we're attempting to do. So, I mean, we can go into the surveys. I won't go into it uh, too much, but here are some of the uh, questions we're asking folks. Um, we have a arts and corrections grant. So, um, and a lot of that was prompted to by people inside. They're like, we want to do more art. And I'm like, tell me what kind of art you want to do. We have an art and reentry grant. So we have like some really, um, dope people just coming over there and, and um, uh, doing their art. So we have Breon Bain, who is a professor um, over at UCLA. He's also had a BET uh, television show. He's a spoken word artist. He's also a performer. Um, we had him do a spoken word um, uh, presentation and, and had people make uh, um, spoken word or poetry um, on our Wednesday night uh, reentry healing circle. So. We actually had somebody, we actually had bring people in, whether it's a photographer, Adamu, who uh, some of you may see, uh, 
here coming up. Um, but, you know, we have different artists come in and kind of share their art so that people can, you know, do other things while our garden is an art. So there's a lot of other mediums. Um, we also, when the pandemic happened, and this is what really sold me on uh, Insight Garden Program, why I even applied, like, what is your ethos, right? What, what happens when things get hard? And when things got hard because of the pandemic, programs shut down, we weren't allowed inside. Um, people were dying inside. And I know we've heard the chaos that was happening over at San Quentin and made the news, still making the news. Um, but rather than just like sitting on our hands and like, well, we'll take this grant money and we'll do other things. Um, our organization pivoted and we created a correspondence package, uh, packet. So people are able to still engage with their curriculum, even if they, we weren't able to physically be there. Um, and we were like one of only a few programs in California doing that. Um, and that's what sold me on taking this job because I'm like, I need to know that like our values are aligned. And this right here, that our, our example correspondence packet is an example of that. This right here, there's a little bit to unpack here. Um, one is California created a state law where we're no longer supposed to be transporting youth into our youth prisons here in California. They're still, they're still open. They still have some youth inside those prisons, um, but they're not, they're supposed to be closing like a hard close by June. I don't, I, I don't have confidence that it will happen, but in, in that uh, we create a, we used to be able to um, be inside OH closes, which is one of four juvenile state prisons here in California. Um, there's Chad, which is right across the parking lot from OH close. There's Ventura and then there's um, the fire camp and somewhere in Amador County, I can't think of the, the city. So there's four facilities. Um, we were in one. And so we created a, a youth curriculum that uses the parable to soar, right? Um, Afrofuturism and being able to connect uh, young people to literature, to gardening, um, and it just even liberation work and understanding what that means for themselves. So we created a, a curriculum. I hope to be back into a, a juvenile facility here soon, but California and the counties really need to pull themselves together um, to be able to allow us to do that. And so that that's kind of the gist of our, our in-prison programming. I do want to talk about um, our reentry support. Um, reentry was also birthed out of the uh, pandemic. Um, there was a mass exodus of people leaving prisons as a result of COVID. Um, I believe at one in the first year, 8,000 people were released um, and they were released homeless. They were just released uh, with zero preparation or very minimal preparation. And we saw that need. And rather than saying, oh, you're on your own, uh, we went ahead and hired um, a program coordinator, a reentry manager. We started hiring folks that, who can provide a reentry services, not just anybody, but people who have also done time. I uh, mentioned a gentleman earlier who did 30 years. His name's Jamala. He is the reentry manager. We had Gunner on staff. Gunner did 17 years. Um, we had we have Arnold on staff. Arnold did 25 years as a lifer. Um, and we also have Robert on staff who has done, you know, what we would call like wino time. Uh, people who are in and out like the county facilities due to like uh, substance abuse, misuse issues. So, um, you know, we have we ha we have a lot of different people with a lot of different experience. So we're not just saying, oh, here's reentry. Um, we're like, we know reentry. We're currently in it. Yeah, I've been out for like 14 years, but I still deal with kind of the wreckage of the past as related to my own incarceration. So we we um, we're there. We're doing gate pickups. So when people are getting released, we're picking them up and we're driving them home. And even before they're released, we're helping them find housing. Um, housing is a big issue. So um, we work with the prison administration and we try to make sure that we can come up with a, a, a plan that's actually going to work for them. Something that they can have, um, you know, autonomy over. So it's not the, like, oh, we found this place, um, come here. It's how do you feel about this? Where would you want to go? What county is it? 
um, what kind of employment opportunities are available. So really trying to see the whole person rather than just say, oh, you need housing. Let's just go to Santa Maria because I know there's a house in Santa Maria. Um, and I mentioned a team earlier, Gunner's not on here because Gunner has now transitioned out to Sacramento State. Um, but here, there's Arnold right there in the bottom left. That's the person who did life. There's Robert right there. And then there's Jamala. And here's a, you know, a part of our, and I'm touched on it a little bit, right? Like that our pre-release. So we make sure there's a forum, there's conversations. We have a telephone line where people can talk and communicate because sometimes written communication, they're not always the best at. And so if they can do verbal communications, we try to do that. Or we go inside the prisons regularly and they can talk with any one of our program managers. So we wanna make sure that the, the lines of communication are open, but also accessible to people depending on where their strengths are and how they wanna communicate. Um, so we, we, we start that before somebody goes home. And then at, like I said, at release, we make sure that we pick them up we provide them with a cell phone uh, at release because we know in 2023, if you don't have a cell phone, life is a little bit harder. So we make sure that folks have access to that. Um, and then my favorite part is taking them to their first meal. I like, you know, I'm sure there's like other foodies here, but like for me, I'm like, I know the spot to eat, right? Like I know, I know California pretty well because I travel it pretty well. Um, and I'm like, oh, let's go to this spot. So I know the spot in Avenal for tacos. I know the spots in Lancaster, Pasadena, it doesn't matter. You take me anywhere. I'm like, I got the place to go. Um, and I try to get folks a really good meal. It's not like we're not stopping by McDonald's or whatever and getting that six pack of nuggets. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to decent places and where people are, are actually have the right to choose what they want to eat. Um, and that's really special because I still, here I am 14 years out. I still remember my first meal. Um, it was a Baconator from Wendy's, um, but it was, I still remember my first meal. So, um, and, and then after that, we have, um, after somebody's home and they, they're situated, we have Zoom meetings Wednesday night where we do art or we'll, we'll do like a financial literacy or resume building or mock interviews or wherever it might be. It's like a skills building area. And then on Thursday night, we hold a healing circle. So a bunch of people have done time and in those, they will talk about like, What's going on with them? Where are your struggles? Where, what's going well? What's not going well? And we talk it through. You know, I, I mentioned earlier about like an enculturation. And it's, you know, it even goes in that space, right? We, we are speaking a language people understand because we are them and they are us. And uh, when we hear, you know, people say, oh, I can't, I can't get a job because of this. We're like, well, this is what has worked for me in the past and to be able to share that information. And so whether it's the people part of IGP or other people within that healing circle, collectively we come together and we share information and we support each other. Um, I won't go too much into the strengths and challenges. Just know that like, you know, I, I, I touched on a lot of this stuff um, already, you know, kind of like what we did during COVID, our pickups and all that stuff. Um, one thing I will say about challenges is housing is a huge issue in California. Um, whether you're in college or you're just like a blue collar worker or wherever you come from, housing is just a, a difficult issue for everybody. Um, and it's much more so when there's like systemic barriers in place, uh, you know, not allowing people with uh, incarceration history or, or, or conviction histories being able to rent properties. That is an issue, that's a real issue. And so how do we get around it? Um, and then on top of that is a lot of the, the reentry services that are out there are really dedicated towards men. And while men make up a huge amount of the prison population, there's still women and, and trans folks and non-binary folks who don't have that kind of like reentry services that are really devoted to being gender responsive. Um, so in my strategic plan, we have, um, Reentry housing in there. I don't know what it looks like yet. We haven't bought it yet. I'm fundraising for it now. But the idea is I want a small apartment complex. We want to serve women. We want to work on family reunification. We want to be able to have those things and then be able to live in an environmentally friendly space and really model what it means to live on your own. And a lot of the, what we see in these transitional housing, 
very rigid, strict rules, this, that. Um, and that's not, that's not how we get down at IGP. It's, it's about our ethos. It's about who we are. It's our connectedness to each other. I couldn't live under those conditions. Why would I expect somebody else to live under those conditions? Um, and so we're going to work on creating housing here in California. I have a budget ask in to the California legislature right now, hoping they buy us a home so we can go ahead and start this uh, process up. Um, and then inside the prisons a little bit, um, we, we are working on creating a permaculture certification program. We use citizen science. So we work with UC Davis, um, Department of Education, where they come in, they teach people about citizen science. Uh, citizen science is kind of an easy, accessible way of being able to like see what bugs or what plants are in the area, what's coming, what pollinators are flying in and then uh, documenting it and then sharing it to um, a website. And so we're working with UC Davis on being able to collect that data so we can understand what's going on in our gardens. Um, some of our gardens are in, um, are in toxic soil. So Avenal um, has a fungi in the soil. The fungi causes, causes valley fever. Um, valley fever kills people. I was in a prison with valley fever and I saw people die as a result of it. So. Um, to be able to run a gardening program with toxic soil, while difficult, we make it happen. Um, but we also use the citizen science approach to be able to uh, recognize what things are coming up, what plants are there and everything else. And then we also, you know, we're working on a, a, a community um, community farm in Sacramento at, across the street from the Oki Park. Um, we do volunteers with Three Sisters Gardens, um, where my friend Alfred is the ED of it. So. We do a number of different things inside and outside uh, the, the program. Um, we also, like I said, life for coaching. So those with life, the process of getting released is much different than those who have a date. And so when they get out, same thing, restrictions and the, the stipulations that parole puts on people who serve life sentences are much different. Um, and so we have um, folks right there. Matter of fact, right there is Jamal on, uh, see the left picture. He's in a uh, white t-shirt. Um, he just got released. The last gift CDCR gave him before leaving the prison was COVID. Um, and there he is. Um, and the person next to him um, brought him tacos. And, you know, that's, so we weren't able to do the gate pickup for Jamala, but there he, we are trying to be with him in a very difficult moment uh, in the middle of COVID. We also do what we call harvesting insights. So taking the information that participants share with us and in creating um, a book it, book, booklet and information packet uh, that kind of helps folks uh, through that uh, process of reentry. And then we also, um, we're also working on creating like a restorative justice and sexual harm. Uh, there's a lot of people um, in prison who may make the, the sex registry, the 290 registry. And, um, and there's a myriad of reasons, right? There's not like, oh, this person harmed children or this and that. There's a myriad of reasons why somebody would be placed on the registry. There's a lot of scrutiny around the, the uh, rules that, that, that put people on the registry and what get them there. And I know this is kind of like a taboo subject, but I also don't want to like gloss over it either. Um, so we are working on ways to, to work on the, uh, to work on supporting folks who are in the 290 registry. Um, I talked a little bit about having like the small apartment complex that's family reunification. And in that, that's that restorative justice part of our organization. You know, we want to restore people as whole human beings before, um, you know, while we're with them. All right. So, um, we're going to watch a video real fast. And then after the video, I will be kind of taking questions. And so if there's things that you, you want to ask me, feel free, be candid. I'm like, I'm not up here to like gloss over or candy uh, coat anything. Just you want the truth, I'll give it to you. So shoot them to me after this video. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sorry.
I'm good. Perfect. Yeah. So I, when I see like a mother, you, you know, uh, reunite with their child, that's like, yeah, that, that hits, right. Um, I've been able to see it a few times when I've done, done the gate pickups where whether it's a brother or sister or another family member or niece, nephew, um, would meet somebody that we just picked up and I brought them home. Um, and they're like, the power of emotion that kind of happens in that moment where people are like, I'm finally with you. That hits. Um, and in many ways, that's what keeps me kind of going, despite like the ugliness of some of the things that pop up uh, related to this work. So that's, yeah, I always kind of go there every time I've seen this video, I've probably seen it a hundred times or more. So um, I still feel it. So for, for questions, is it, Anybody have questions about our in prison? Yes. Uh, do you hope to expand your program to other prisons? Like I know I noticed that Wasco State Prison isn't on there. Um, is there any hope or work to expand? Yeah, I mean, I'm always open to expand, expect, particularly here in California and to other state prisons here in California. We seem to have the most advantage of being able to get into that space because we're we started in a state prison in San Quentin 20 years ago. So um, my hope is to do to serve more yards, to be able to um, serve more prisons. The the you know the the reality of it all is, you know we we are an organization that really wants to center not only the people we're serving but our staff, and then that means that we have to pay a living wage, you know, and provide all the. Um, you know, benefits that come with it. So pay time off, health benefits, dental, medical, um, the whole, the whole gamut. Um, and so my programs have a cost to them. And what I, what I hear also is like, oh, I want your program. So they're, the prison I paroled from Soledad um, recently hit me up and they're like, we would like their garden program here. I'm like, I would love to be there. And they're like, all right, come on over. Here's a, here's a plot of land. I'm like, it's not really that simple. Like I have people to pay, people have to eat. I mean, I like to eat. Um, and so um, that's it. That's the big issue. Um, there, we have the ability to grow and we have, um, but just making sure that there's sustainable funding sources. That's the other part of it. You know, CDCR, um, you know, they're, they're at the will like political wins because they are a state agency. And, you know, some years are like, oh, we have money. And some years are like, well, we don't want to necessarily give you all your grants or everything that you're asking for. And so there are processes in place, but they're so, they're not sustainable. They're it's not something I can depend on. So I do work with like foundations, individual donors, um, and of course, other type of grants that would be able to provide us. Um, 
and we do want to grow, but I think at the moment, a big part of what we want to do is sustain what we have with the right. staff that we have. Okay. And but then, I'm down to go Wasco. Yeah, I, I do have another question. Um, is there anything, I guess, that we, like a group that are present here can do to like support you and the program in any way? Um, that's a really good question. And, and normally I'm prepared for these kind of questions and I feel like I'm not at the moment. Um, yeah, there, there are ways to get involved. So there are like, we have on our website that insightgardenprogram.org. Uh, there is a volunteer form. So if they're, you know, if you wanted to volunteer in a prison or in reentry or wherever else, like there's an opportunity to volunteer that way. Um, another, another kind of easy one is like sharing on social media. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook, being able to get our name out there. Um, we understand that like not everybody has money to give, but you have networks and they're super powerful um, and they, they're really helpful. Um, and, you know, and through those networks, we've been able to connect with all kinds of people. Um, we had somebody do a fundraiser for us in Evanston, Illinois. We don't have a program in uh, Illinois and yet people are fundraising for us. So I think some of the easier things is, you know, spread the word. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people figure, you know, $5 donation and it goes a long way, whether it's $5 or, or whatever somebody's capacity, it goes a long way. I think a big part of what I try to do is on my paycheck, I actually give some back, uh, you know, back into the organization. Um, because, I, you know, I think it, for me, it's easier to ask folks for money when I'm also giving it myself. Um, and so um, that's a, that's a, thank you for bringing that up. That's a, um, that's kind of like some of the ways that are able to support. Yeah. And then also, you know, I'm really big on just learning about who, who people are what, and how they want to get involved and then be able to use your strengths in such a way to where you can, you can feel like uh, you're being heard and your strengths are being utilized and then being able to utilize it for, for the, um, for the program. So I think there's a few ways to, to get involved. And then we always have positions open uh, we have some AmeriCorps uh, VISTA positions open. Um, not sure if you're familiar with AmeriCorps, but for people who are students, um, it's kind of a good way to get yourself some real real work experience. Um, but AmeriCorps is a really good thing to have on your resume or CV. Um, and then also there's, I think they help with some of the student loan stuff. There's all kinds of things. I would just recommend going to the AmeriCorps website and look at the VISTA program. So we're also hiring um, two VISTA members um, in the next month. So I think that the job description will go out next month and it will also be on our website. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, you'd mentioned in the beginning of your presentation that you'd help someone get released that had like been sentenced like a hundred and something years at 17. But you didn't mention like what they'd get sentenced, they'd gotten sentenced for. And I guess that was my question. For him, um, it was attempted murder. Um, nobody died in his case. Um, but I don't say that to minimize uh, the act that he did, but I'd also want to bring the truth to it. Um, it was attempted murder. I think the person, you know, is severely like injured for the rest of their lives as a result of it. Um but he was also sentenced to 164 years of life. I, I know people who committed double homicide and was given 15 years of life. So there's uh, disparities between uh, certain people when they go in front of a court. And then on top of that, add in that he was a juvenile, uh, 16 years old when it had taken place. Um, like he's not even grown up. I don't know about you, but when I was 16, I was, I was dumb as fuck. I, was, I did a lot of stupid stuff. Um, and this is not to like, you know, minimize, but I think, you know, we also need to add, give a little grace to children too. Um, they are kids. Um, so that's that. And by the way, I went to prison for involuntary manslaughter. So I punched my friend and knocked him out. He hit his head against the ground on the way down and it caused a subdural hematoma. And he died two weeks later as a result of those injuries. My first deal was 15 years of life on second degree murder. Um, so that's kind of like, there, I, 
I fought for it. Lucky for me, I had like a sound mind and ability and just knew that like something wasn't right uh, when I went through it. And so I learned how to shepherdize, how, how to understand some case law. And then I would come to my, meet with my attorneys and like, hey, here's this case. And um, so in many ways, I had to learn how to do some of the legwork so I can inform my attorney to create, help me get a more fair outcome. I knew I was guilty of something, but it didn't feel like murder. And there were about to be two families without their sons. So, yeah, that's what I, I went to prison for. Uh, I guess I have another question too. In cases where like you're trying to get people released, do you ever like talk to the victims like families on how they like what they think about someone being paroled? There's actually strict laws um, um, around that. And um, usually that goes through like um, victims compensation board and all the different the DAs. Um, and so what I do is when I, my letters speak to the person's character. So I write about who I know who the person is in front of me, how they've uh, engaged in our program and what I, you know, what I know about them. And so somebody may had like done something really bad one day. And then 30 years later, they're in front of me and they're not the same person. I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm not even the same person I was from last year, let alone wait 30 years after that. And so, um, so I, I can only speak about the person who is in front of me and their character. And I just described that. And then in that, I'm, I also put down like what I can do to support that person. So I don't speak about anything I don't know about because I think that would be unfair to everybody involved. So when I'm not here facilitating social justice week, I'm a lawyer and get people out of prison to can talk a little bit about that. So there is a registration people can choose to get on as victims if they want to be notified when people who have indeterminate sentences are going before the parole board or determinate sentences are getting released. And so that is affiliated with also getting people compensation if there was harm for therapy, for things like that. But a lot of people choose not to register or don't know that they're entitled to compensation or notification. And so sometimes in cases we will find somebody so I will hire a private investigator, try to find the person and then say, you know, would you support this person's um, application for resentencing for early release? And sometimes people do, sometimes people don't. Yeah, thank you. And I actually have a pretty, I would say cool story, but I have a good story that I think it might be of interest. Does it uh, involve a Van Jones documentary? Yes. Oh, you want me to touch on that? It. Yeah, so I wasn't sure um, if you were going to mention it or not. <laughs> my coworker Gunner um, was sleeping in his bed one night. At that time, he I think he was selling weed. I mean, it was just weed. Um, he was selling weed, and somebody broke into his house, and um, he had his friend Patrick lay on the couch, and Patrick was killed right there instantly as soon as they broke into the house. They went into the bedroom where Gunner was at because Gunner was a dealer and Gunner sat up in the bed, they shot him too. Um, and then he kind of wakes up and he sees him walking out with his safe. Um, he still has a, Gunner still has a bolt in his neck. Um, as a result of that, you know, he was put on opiates to deal with the pain. Um, the two gentlemen that were uh, the shooters, they were sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. And, um, you know, Gunner, you know, created a, a, had a really bad drug addiction. And in that, he started robbing banks. And I, and I say that because hurt people hurt people. Um, and um, Gunner ended up getting incarcerated. He got a 17-year, actually got like a 22-year term, but then ended up uh, serving 17 of that. Um, when he got out, he received a, when he got out, um, he made some sort of contact inside the prison. And then the person who shot him wrote him in a 38 page amends letter and talked about everything and just really opened up and took accountability for what he had did and the harm that he caused in killing Patrick and for shooting Gunner. And, um, they, their Van Jones, 
uh, heard about it through Healing Dialogue in Action, how we are starring, um, and some other folks, and they wanted to film it. And so if you go to... Um, I think it's just Healing Dialogues, but you can find it on like Rotten Tomatoes or links on any of those like re IMDB review sites. Yeah, it's on CNN too. Or you can email me, Henry at Sonoma.edu, and they've come to my class and talked as well, and we have that recorded. And uh, hold on. And after they had, like, they met inside the prison, they had a healing dialogue. And so those questions that Gunnar had for himself, because he had blacked out, he didn't know exactly what transpired because he had, was asleep and then he was shot. You know, they, they had to be really open and honest in that conversation. They talked it out. And then, um, you know, all that kind of came through and it came brought to the governor's attention. And then the governor um, learned about it and, you know, muted his sentence to where he was able, he was eligible to go see the, the parole board. When he saw the parole board, Gunner showed up and testified at his hearing and says, I, you know, I forgive this person. The DA told Gunner, well, you're not the victim. Um, Patrick is the victim. And Gunner's all, I still have the bullet in my neck. Um, and Gunner was able to provide testimony to the parole board. And Christian was released. And I actually we got to be with him in New York when Christian and Gunner got to present for the very first time on the healing dialogue that they had with each other. Um, I was in Los Angeles, or I'm almost out of time. Um, I was in Los Angeles um, a few weeks ago and I sat right next to Christian and Gunner and we all had dinner together and we're like the best of friends. So I think there's, there's, there's a kind of a lot to unpack there, but I would like really encourage folks to learn about the process of restorative justice, healing dialogues and the transformation that people can make even after their worst day and the harm that they cause to other people. And did you have another question? I had gone to another kind of like speaking thing where a woman had talked about how she was incarcerated, but she was able to receive a pardon because the reason she had, she was kind of like arrested. She was like involved in like trafficking. And so as a result, she was arrested, but it wasn't really, she wasn't wanting to commit those crimes or anything. So she'd receive, received like a pardon or something so that her record could be expunged. Um, obviously that's probably a small number of cases that could be expunged like that. But do you have anything like that that you kind of try to do or may? Um... Yeah, we support people through that process. One of the women that was up on the video, and I didn't point her out, but, um, you know, there's lots of women who, who will fight back against their abuser. And then they end up getting, becoming incarcerated. And, and it's really not uncommon either. So I just want to. So it's so common that they actually have specialized housing for it in the Bay Area over on Treasure Island. Um, and uh, one of the women over there, you know, killed her abuser. She was given a life without the possibility of parole for doing so. Um, we got her, we got her out. And she was then paroled to San Diego. And now she's, you know, on Treasure Island. Um, about to be a part of another program in, in Oakland. So um, there's a, kind of a lot of that going on too. So we really try to start with like a commutation process and then pardons. Pardons are kind of a tricky thing sometimes, you know, like some people really need them because of immigration cases that may be coming up for them. Um, I myself still haven't received a pardon. I also haven't applied yet because there's some things kind of going on with my stuff that I need to take care of, including high amounts of restitution. Um, so, you know, just kind of getting through that process, it's, it's sometimes it's a really difficult and, um, messy uphill process for a lot of people and everybody's all in a different situation. So expungements work for some and not for others. Um, certificate real base, rehabilitations work for some and not for others. And so there's all these different kind of things that they compartmentalize to give people a little bit more freedom and a little bit more freedom but none of them truly give somebody full freedom. Last question before I close out with a reminder about these uh, surveys that we'd like you to fill out. 
Uh, can we come on a field trip and visit you? Did anybody, is anyone in the room, uh, did anybody come to CMF last year when we visited the program? You did, yeah. So we had a great time visiting Pause for Life. We would love to go back, but we would love to visit some other programs. Do you do anything with the annoying clearance process to let people come? Yeah, I'm, we definitely would love to have uh, a guest in. We find uh, that people who come from the outside in are well received because you're not a correctional officer. Anytime you're not a correctional officer or somebody who acts like an asshole inside, they love you. Um, and rightfully so, right? You're deserving of love and care too. And um, yeah, we would love to have somebody uh, or have a, a small group or a group co go in. We're in San Quentin on Fridays afternoons. We're on um, Solano, I think is also a pretty good place. I wouldn't recommend CMF because it's kind of a, a messy spot right now. Um, but I definitely recommend those two institutions. And we have a, a great program manager at both of them. Awesome. Well, let's uh, do a round of applause and thank our speaker. Please fill out the evaluation forms. We rely on this to pay our speakers and get feedback for the next years. And then join us for the transition into agroecology. We're going to have speakers here who are part of the um, garden project here at Sonoma. And we're going to cross pollinate the vibes here. Uh, they'll talk for a little bit and we'll walk over to the garden. And then we'll have um, Troy Williams, who's going to talk about his journey with incarceration, restorative justice and making media. Um, we also have other prison focused uh, panels and themes. So Adamu, who was in St. Quentin during the outbreak, who made a film about it, is going to be here and uh, Friday, we have a bunch of food. So join us Friday for lunch and uh, refreshments. When we do our award ceremony, one of the winners of the awards, Kenya, is in the um, in the audience. So come recognize her and we will see you for the rest of the week. Thanks.